Welcome everyone, I'm here with Professor David Clark from Oxford University and from NHS England who's just given a talk here at the IACT Connect 19 conference. You gave a kind of whistle-stop overview of IACT um, since the original idea in 2005 and since it began in 2008 and you also gave some kind of really interesting more recent data. Give us in a nutshell what you think you've achieved so far with IAPT and what you think you still need to achieve in the coming five or ten years? Um, well, I think the, one of the biggest achievements in IAPT, which goes beyond IAPT, is that it's changed the way people think about commissioning mental health services. So, um, up until IAPT, um, think, thought was all focused on input variables. You know, uh, how many people would you see in a particular service, how long they would wait. Um, there was nothing about whether patients actually get better. Um, and IAPT has uh, introduced a sort of outcome monitoring system where you now collect data on how much people's symptoms change and how much their disability changes, um, where because you're measuring at each session, we can get data on essentially everyone, 99% of people are treated, and we publish that data. So it means that commissioners can now actually think about, well, how can we ensure that we uh, commission services that are also effective in terms of the outcomes to get with patients? And also, because of the public transparency, it means we can learn an enormous amount about how to better deliver therapy. And so one of the slides I showed today um, was uh, showing how the sort of outcomes of IAPT have improved really quite dramatically over the last 10 years from round about um, less than 40% of people uh, recovering in the uh, services. Obviously, there's more people get some benefit, but uh, about 40% recovery. And now we've gone up to uh, maybe 53% of that and uh, almost 70% of people showing worthwhile improvement. And that's because we've learned from uh, all of the outcome data. And I think that's a message that is really being picked up uh, in many other countries. And there are uh, services now being developed in many European countries and North American uh, areas um, which are now focusing not just on you know, what we provide but whether it really helps. Um, and we're learning so much more from that. So I think that's, in a sense, the biggest contribution of IAM to mental health. Looking at the data over the last decade, one of the groups that haven't recovered as well from IAM services are people from BAME backgrounds. And you were talking about some recent data saying that there have been some improvements in that group. Tell us about that. Yes. So, um, I mean, the, the, the um, uh, outcomes of the BAME group have gone up dramatically over this period of time. But they've tended to be a bit below um, the sort of average outcome. So, at, mo at the moment, the recovery rate is 52% for people in general. And if you're from the BAME community, it's 49.9%. So only a small difference, but one we'd like to completely remove. Um, but it was much larger a few years ago. Um, and I think because uh, we publish data on you know, outcomes by different groups, it allows people to then focus on those problems, which you wouldn't be aware of if you didn't publish the data. So uh, there is a very good, um, uh, good practice guide for um, developing delivering treatment in an effective way in the BAME community, which has just been published by people in IATS who work with the BAME community. And um, that, I think, will help even further. Um, but it's only because of the public transparency that people get to do these initiatives and improve things. Andrew Beck from the BABCP was tweeting just as you were talking about the guide, so we've we shared a link to it. So people Wonderful. Read. And yeah. it was made available yesterday. So I'm and Andrew was one of the key uh, authors of it, so wonderful. Great. What about people who don't get into IAP services, or people who wait a long time, or people who get in and then leave quite quickly? So you're, you're talking about recovery rates within the service. What about the people that don't get on well with it? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing to say in terms of the outcome data is um, the, the outcome data is on everyone who's seen at least twice. So um, there would be quite a number of people in that data set who you might say didn't have a full course of treatment but we're still reporting their outcomes, so that's really critical. So it isn't just the people who got on incredibly well and have many, many sessions that we're reporting on. It's more or less the whole treated cohort. But there is a problem that um, because IAPT is such a big program and, and in general so successful, it tends to be the case that 
um, people with a whole range of mental health problems, which may be different from what I was created for, get referred in. Um, and that's not really great for them because they get an assessment and then told this isn't really the right thing for you and it's a frustration for them. But it's also not good for the services because of course it means that more time is taken up by doing this sort of triage uh, rather than focusing on delivering treatment and reducing wait times. So this is an area where things need to improve um, and there are two bits to that. I think um, IAP needs to help people um, understand much more what happens in the services and what are the things that IAP can really help people with and what are the things that somewhere else might be more appropriate for. And I think um, there's the London services are now trying to develop a sort of digital triage program where people online can find out much more about what would happen if you came into IAP, what would be the treatments available, you can see is this the sort of thing that I think would help me or not. Um, and what are the sort of problems that it can help and also do probably some of the screening you can do in the privacy of your own home in the digital thing and we hope that will help quite a lot. The other thing of course that we hope will help is quite a lot of the plans in the NHS long-term plan for mental health because um, it's not just IAMP that is expanding at the moment. There are strong commitments to expand many other mental health services including you know, creating a, a, a new uh, mental health service for uh, homeless people. And these are all part of the tapestry that's required. If only IANT is, is expanding and we're not really getting expansion in other areas, psychosis services and things like that, obviously we're going to have a problem that uh, people with these other conditions are not getting help and tend to be steered in the wrong direction. You said in your talk, IAPT is not just a CBT service. That's correct. And that's certainly something that is often perceived. Yes. Um, tell us a bit about, and we had a tweet actually during your talk from somebody who said, what about people with personality disorder diagnoses? Yes. Tell us a bit about how IAPT supports people with more severe difficulties, what the high intensity options are that are available. Yes. So the first thing to say is that IAPT really is defined as something which tries to deliver nice guidance. And what it delivers will change as nice guidance changes because that's you know, the defining feature of the services. Um, and NICE recommends quite a number of different high intensity therapies for depression. Uh, CBT is one of them, but also interpersonal psychotherapy. Couples therapy, if you are depressed in the context of a relationship issue and your partner is still willing to work in therapy with you and try and help. Um, and also uh, brief psychodynamic therapy, um, and for those people who've got recurrent depression, also mindfulness can be a good way of building resilience once you've got a lot of the recovery from your current episode. So these are all things that we uh, support in IAMT, and we uh, really ask all services to give patients who are depressed, who are going for the high intensity treatment, a choice of therapies. And that is generally what's happening. So. Uh, the latest data shows that 93% of all of the IAP services give patients a choice between at least two different therapies, high intensity therapies of depression. The most common one is between CBT or counselling um, for depression. Um, but many of the other therapies are coming in, but in a smaller number of services. And we think this is important because we think uh, it gives people um, autonomy and um, is likely to improve um, outcomes if we can give choice because we know in the psychotherapy research that if someone sees a treatment as credible, making sense to them, they're more likely to respond to it. And you know, some therapies may seem more credible to people than others. So, so that's the sort of things that are available. You're asking about severity. Um, it is a common misunderstanding of IAMS that it's only for mild to moderate problems. And I think it is true that some of NHS's publicity about the program described it that way. But the data has never borne that out. So if you look at, say, uh, depression, um, not the measure of severity is the uh, PHQ-9, um, and um, the NICE says the sort of cutoff between mild to moderate and moderate to severe depression is 17. The average intake PHQ score in IAP for depression cases is 17.8. So actually, over half of the people we see are in the moderate to severe range. 
Um, and we still get very good outcomes with them. Um, you had a question about personality disorders. Well, um, for those services that do some personality screening with, with SAPATS, we find quite a lot of people who are treated in I do also have a personality disorder. And we're still getting good out outcomes. But there is a distinction, I think, uh, clinically between someone who you might say, you know, everyone agrees, including the client, that it is a sort of more general personality issue that re requires treatment, uh, rather than someone who has personality issues and is also currently very depressed or disabled by anxiety. And we can focus more on that and open things up for them. Um, so it isn't a service that is aiming to deliver the sort of nice recommended long-term therapies for personality disorders. Um, they are things that we want to be made more widely available in the NHS, but it's not part of IAPT. But there are a lot of people who also have personality difficulties who are benefiting a lot from IAPT treatment. What's your long-term vision for IAPT in terms of this question about triage and treatment choice? You know, if you, if you listen to the geneticists and the data scientists, they'll say that, you know, it won't be too long before we can offer very personalised treatments and recommend to people which antidepressant is likely to help them more based on their personal setting, um, personal situation. How do you think IAPT will develop in that sort of sense? Um, well, I mean, there, there are several things you can say about that. The first is, of course, you know, the IAPT data set is enormous, and we can learn quite a lot from that about those people who are responding well, those who are not responding so well. Rob Saunders at UCL has done a very good project where he's created um, a number of what you call different latent profiles and identified a subset of people who really don't do well at the moment. Um, and um, I think I know some of the services are now taking up that work and thinking, well, what, how can we change the treatment somewhat to deal with those people? Um, I mean, one of the features of these people, which is quite interesting, is that they tend to score very high on the phobia measures, uh, particularly agoraphobia and things. And um, that hasn't been picked up on them. That they also, you know, have other uh, social uh, uh, complications and problems, and people tend to focus on that. But we think actually some of uh, their sort of phobias are really seriously undertreated. And so I know uh, in some services they're actually looking at that particular subset of people and trying to evolve the treatment they offer them and see whether that helps. Um, and so I think that's one exciting development. The other thing is really to ensure that we use all of the complex features of the different high intensity therapies that we use. So if we take CBT for example, you know, People talk about it as though it's some sort of standardized thing, as thought record, uh, activity schedule and things. That's not good CBT. Good CBT is really focusing on what's the very individual thoughts that cause distress to that particular person, and how do those thoughts interlock with different uh, changes in behavior and emotion. And you get very different interlocking patterns for different patients, and actually, really good CBT personalizes the intervention to deal with that interlock. And so um, really ensuring that the therapists are trained to do that very personalized intervention is critical, but also that our new digital programs do the same. So if you look at different um, um, online um, therapy programs, um, you find some of them are very much the same intervention for every patient. It might be CBT, but it's the same CBT. Others um, are incredibly personalised. So you will um, you know, uh, fill in some questionnaires about what are your particular fears, your particular uh, uh, depressing thoughts or fearful thoughts, and it would take you down a completely different set of modules depending on those particular thoughts. So um, in a programme that we developed for social anxiety, we recently did a, a randomised controlled trial there, and we have about 100 patients in that trial. No two patients had the same intervention in the internet program because the modules that they were, they were led to, depending on their thoughts, um, were different and the sequencing was different. And so I think it's not just using the data in clever ways and doing digital phenotyping or genetic phenotyping. Um, it's also using some of the sophistication that we already know around these therapies to ensure that they're really properly individualized. 
the way the most skilled psychotherapists have always done. Our opening um, remarks from Pukki were all about giving therapists the, the space and the time and the skills to connect with patients and to gain trust and to communicate well. Um, what do you think we can do to improve the current situation for IAPT staff so that they're able to do that more? Um, well, so Puki made some very good points, I think, one of which is to say go beyond the diagnosis, find out what it is that someone is individually fearful of. And that is, of course, a central strength um, of cognitive therapy, which you know, focuses on the particular thoughts that people have rather than their diagnosis. And it's very important that people go with those strengths because it's very important for patients. Um, but, um, of course, it's easier for people to do that if they feel um, that they have the resources to think about their work and the time to do it. And so one of the big challenges for IAMT is to ensure that as it tries to see more patients, it also dramatically increases the size of its workforce. And we've had some problems with that. Um, the programme, when it started, um, would give CCGs, or PCTs at the time, um, the full salary costs of their IAP trainees. They might be working three days a week in the service and then uh, two days a week in the university, but the PCT didn't have to pay for any of those five days. Um, and it was only when someone had qualified that the PCT would then have to take up the salary. And the deal was, if you uh, accept a trainee, you will give them a permanent job when they start as a trainee. So if they pass the course, you will commit to funding them and they've got a secure job. That was a system which worked incredibly well. And almost everyone who came on as an IAM trainee ended up working in IAM services. And so we were able to grow the workforce quickly. Then there was a sort of change. And um, it, it, uh, at one point it was said, well, the CCGs need to cover the salary costs of the trainees as well. Um, but the announcement about this came out in a year where, a bit after CCGs had already made their budget allocations and said so there was a big drop in numbers of trainees. And so we have undertrained in the last few years. Um, and so we have a, a capacity problem. Um, in a, the way that the NHS has tried to address this is to go back um, closely to where we started from. So now uh, NHS England has said it will cover 60% of the salary costs of all trainees on condition that a CCG guarantees that the trainee will then have a job afterwards. Because, you know, if you're going on a detailed one-year training course, you want to know that you've got a job at the end of it. And we also want to not waste training resources on people who don't end up doing the job. Um, so that's a very positive development, but it's just happened. And I don't think all CCGs are quite cottoned on to this. And we do need them to respond to that and grow the workforce. Because otherwise it's just getting too stressful. Um, of course, it's not just a matter of having enough people there, it's also having the right climate in services. Um, and it is undoubtedly the case that there are some services where the management structure is really driving people towards certain targets rather than focusing on you know, the overall aims you want to achieve for the service and the well-being of the staff in it. And that needs to change. Um, and the IAP manual has quite a lot on that. Uh, there's a section on don't get obsessed with targets. Realise that these are, there, there's something more important that you're trying to uh, gain uh, and achieve with your patients than just achieving a couple of metrics. They're sort of proxies for something more broader, and you need to focus on the broader thing. But it's also the case that you know, if we're spending a lot of time thinking about the well-being of our clients, we also have to spend uh, the same amount of attention thinking about the well-being of our own staff. And um, this is morally the right thing to do, but it also helps the service. Um, people are much more productive when they are enjoying their work and feeling they have space to do it properly. So outcomes for services in, improve as well at that point. So we've been sort of very clear in the manual that we'd like all services uh, to get together the staff and the clinical leads uh, to develop their own sort of 
in-house wellbeing programs that are co-produced by the staff and the clinical needs, just in the same way that therapy should be co-produced by patients and the therapists. We need to apply the same skills within our services as we apply with our clients. As always, really interesting talking to you. Thanks very much for taking the time.